Hello comrades. In this video I would like to discuss a topic that has recently uh, been brought to my attention. I always remember that there have been people who have said that socialist countries and socialist systems that have existed in history that they were not real socialism or they were not socialist. There's always been people who say that. I'm not going to single out anarchists because I think the anarchist argument boils down to the state question, but they still quite often also repeat these other arguments that some other people also make. In plenty of uh, video responses that I've done, I've encountered um, Trotskyists or left communists or anarchists who will say that, well, the Soviet Union wasn't socialist, so it doesn't count. They will say, well, our movements haven't really managed to do much of anything, but the Soviet Union also wasn't actually socialist, so it doesn't count, so therefore we're even. Like, allegedly, uh, allegedly we're even now because Trotskyists have never managed to succeed in any revolution, and anarchists have had two short-lived experiments, and while Marxism-Leninism has had a gigantic influence spreading to dozens of countries, establishing socialist societies, um, they say that that doesn't count because they, uh, those countries were not really socialist. Okay, so what do they say? How do they justify this argument? They say that they're state capitalist. That is a quite a popular thing to say. Anarchists oftentimes say that those countries were state capitalist, not socialist. Trotskyists, I've also heard them say that, although there are some differences between Trotskyists because Trotsky himself never said that the Soviet Union was state capitalist, but some modern Trotskyists do say that. Typically, like, Orthodox Trotskyists recognize that the Soviet Union was socialist, but they just say that um, it was bad because there was, like, a Stalinist bureaucracy, as they call it. Usually, my standard response to the state capitalist argument has been this. State capitalism is a capitalist system, obviously. When Lenin talked about state capitalist countries, he talked about countries like Germany, for instance. And a, a state capitalist country is a country where the state has a relatively big role in the economy. Where the state owns some key industries, or at least substantially intervenes and regulates key industries, but it is still a capitalist country. The Soviet Union didn't have capitalism, of course. It didn't have capitalists either. It also didn't have private ownership of the means of production in general. And it didn't have a market economy. It had a planned economy. So the state capitalist argument doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. So what some people do then, they try to redefine what state capitalism means in order to say that the Soviet Union was state capitalist. For instance, they will say, even if the Soviet Union didn't have private ownership of the means of production, even if the Soviet Union didn't have markets, and even if the Soviet Union didn't have capitalists, it was still somehow state capitalist. Now, this argument makes very little sense to me, but what I've heard from um, left communists and other people like that, like, stereotypically, the really dumb argument has been to say that because the workers didn't have control, like anarchists tend to say this, um, that there wasn't worker control. Well, I've never been able to get an anarchist to exactly explain what they mean by worker control because to me, worker control can mean a number of different things. Obviously, the Soviet Union strived to achieve worker control. Worker control basically means that it is a general principle, it means the workers run the society. Well, there was a workers' party that workers could join, other people generally couldn't, or they could get kicked out easier. There was a parliament, same thing, like if you were not from a worker background, it would be difficult for you to get in there, so it was pretty much just workers. There were the local organs of power, local Soviets and poor peasant committees and stuff like that during the collectivization and whatnot. They had all these different kinds of things where workers were involved. Of course, there was, there was the labor unions. So they had all these things and there were no capitalist organizations that were comparable. There were just workers' organs and workers' organizations and workers' institutions. Now, these people will say that once somebody gets elected to a position in an organ like the parliament, then they 
become part of the evil bureaucracy and they don't represent the workers anymore. Well, that is a totally different argument and at that point it becomes a question of how to organize worker control. It doesn't... Um, it's obvious the Soviet Union had worker control. You can argue whether they did it exactly the way you wanted them to do it, but in order for that to happen, anarchists and all these critics would have to explain what they want, which they never do. They just say, oh, that doesn't count, that wasn't real worker control, but they never explain exactly what they want. Sometimes they say we want direct democracy, but you can't have direct democracy for everything. My position is, you should have a compromise. You should have a division of powers so that local issues can be decided locally, directly by the people, within the context and within the limitations of a national plan, which will be drawn up by the people. First draft, people will be interviewed, they will create a plan, and then this plan will be developed by the parliament, accepted by the parliament or council of ministers and whatnot. And the people in the parliament, of course, will be chosen by the people in the localities. So basically it's going to be a compromise between local autonomy and nationwide planning and a combination of direct and representative democracy because you can't have everything done by direct vote. A worker cannot vote on every single thing, not because they're not capable, but because they simply don't have the time. You have to have administrators administrating. That is a full-time job. Enough of that. So the worker control argument doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me either, especially since it's not even an economic argument. We're talking about the mode of production known as socialism. So in my opinion, you can't say that the USSR was state capitalist. It doesn't fit the definition of state capitalism. You can't say they didn't have worker control. And even if you do, that doesn't change the fact that they had socialist economy. So this brings us to some of the more stranger arguments that I've heard recently. For instance, somebody said that the USSR had commodity production and therefore it wasn't socialist. Now, I haven't been able to exactly get the source, like what exactly they mean by that, because Marx never said you can't have commodity production in socialism, at least anywhere that I could find right now. And I haven't been provided a source, so I have no idea what they're even talking about, because whatever. They just like to claim things and then never actually justify them. But to me, this argument seems like one of those grasping at straws, like trying to come up with some excuse, like why the Soviet Union doesn't count, because these people, they've already come to the preconceived notion and the preconceived opinion that the Soviet Union wasn't socialist, and now they just try to find some kind of excuse to justify their position. I don't think anybody could come to that opinion objectively. So, as I understand their point that the Soviet Union had commodity production and therefore it wasn't socialist, well, did the Soviet Union have commodity production? That was debated by the Soviet communists themselves because it, it is somewhat up for debate since um, commodity production means the making of goods to be sold. And um, the Soviets ended up dividing this into um, basically two categories, capitalist commodity production and socialist commodity production. They um, eventually came to the conclusion that the USSR does have commodity production. Uh, Stalin argued that, yes, indeed, they have commodity production, but it is, of course, significantly different from capitalism. So, hence the term socialist commodity production. Marx pointed out that commodity production existed prior to capitalism and also within capitalism, so therefore it doesn't really seem logical to say you have commodity production, therefore you are capitalist. Commodity production is something that exists in all kinds of different systems, but basically it means making of goods to be sold for money. In capitalism, they are made for exchange value, so basically to be sold on the market, not for use value, as in to be used. They will be used, of course, but that is not the point. The point is to sell them for money, to, you know, to get profits. In socialism, however, there is a planned economy, so while they are being paid for, they are essentially made for use according to a plan. So it's very much different. Now, when they say that the USSR had commodity production, therefore it's not socialist. What would it take for a country to not have commodity production then? Because actually Stalin talks about this in his book, 
economic problems of socialism in the USSR. It was written in, I think, 1951, so at the end of his life. He was seriously considering that they should stop commodity production. And in some ways they had, because they had organized a form of trade according to strict regulations and limits between state enterprises and collective enterprises and co-ops and such, and also a system of barter or commodity exchange. So not using money, they would just... Industry would give industrial goods to agriculture, and agriculture would give agricultural produce to industry. You know, exchange, because they both need each other. And then the state would give, for example, give tractors to be used by the collective farmers for free. So that is a that is already a communistic distribution method that is not... Uh, they were not sold, they were given free. In some areas, they had already started moving away from commodity production. But basically, to, to entirely abolish commodity production means that you have to give all things for free. Now, what does that mean? That already implies eliminating money. It implies superabundance. It implies doing away with rationing. Because if you have rationing, I don't see the point of um, abolishing money if you then have to strictly ration things. That is essentially, all that's doing is banning money. That is not a natural withering away of the state. That is a bureaucratic order from above. And that leads to a black market. And second of all, it um, doesn't even really abolish money. It just creates a black market currency and it turns the rationing cards or whatever labor vouchers or rationing certificates into a new form of money, basically. So, I was looking at Das Kapital, Volume 1, and there Marx talks about commodity production, so he says, quote, Only when and where wage labor is its basis does commodity production impose itself upon society as a whole, but only then and there also does it unfold all its hidden potentialities. To say that the supervention of wage labor adulterates commodity production is to say that commodity production must not develop if it is to remain unadulterated. To the extent that commodity production, in accordance with its own inherent laws, develops further into capitalist production, the property laws of commodity production change into the laws of capitalist appropriation. So there's quite a lot to unpack there, but he says, firstly, that only when wage labor is present, then commodity production basically unfolds all its hidden potentialities, and then we start a process which develops capitalism. So, Marx is here talking about how commodity production in pre-capitalism, together with introduction of wage labor, led to the development of capitalism, or capitalistic laws. The noteworthy things about this are, you know, first of all, that commodity production exists in economic modes other than capitalism, so to say that if you have commodity production it's automatically capitalist is questionable, to say the least. Nothing clearly says that you can't have commodity production in other systems besides capitalism. He says commodity production only leads to capitalistic development if there is wage labor. But in the Soviet Union, they didn't have what Marx would consider wage labor. Maybe we will return to that point a bit later. But basically, in order to make this argument work, they have to distort what Marx means by wage labor. I mean, you notice that this is a really weird and bizarre argument. Like, it's uh, when they say that the Soviet Union wasn't socialist, you'd think that they would have, like, a really obvious explanation, but instead it's, like, a, this really complicated theoretical explanation of how it is supposedly the case. But um, before we get to the wage labor thing, let's look at something else. So this is from Marx's The Critique of the Gotha Program, and... There, Marx talks about the dictatorship of the proletariat, socialism, communism, all those things. So, noteworthy thing is that the terminology has changed a little bit from Marx's day. So, Marx and Engels, they used communism and socialism as synonyms for each other. So, for them, socialism and communism meant the same thing. If you were a communist, uh, was the same as if you were a socialist. But instead, they talked about a higher phase of communist society versus a lower phase of communist society, or a lower stage of communist society. So basically, they would say that the Soviet Union represented a lower stage of communist society. Nowadays, Marxists call that socialism. 
and then they call the higher phase of communism communism or full communism. So basically when Marx is talking about higher communism he means full communism and when he's talking about low communism he means socialism. This is an important thing to note because sometimes people make the mistake of thinking that they, they're actually talking about full communism when they're not. He says, quote, But these defects are inevitable in the first phase of communist society, so that's socialism, he goes on, as it is when it has just emerged after prolonged birth pangs from capitalist society. So he's talking about a socialist society like the Soviet Union as it's just emerged from capitalism and just collectivized agriculture and nationalized industry and like done all those things. It's still a different kind of society, but it has just emerged from capitalism. So he goes on, a right can never be higher than the economic structure of society and its cultural development conditioned thereby. In a higher phase of communist society, after the enslaving subordination of the individual to the division of labor and therewith also the antithesis between mental and physical labor has vanished, after labor has become not only a means of life but life's prime want, after the productive forces have also increased with the all-around development of the individual and all the springs of cooperative wealth flow more abundantly, so now he's talking about what we would consider full communism, only then can the narrow horizon of bourgeois right be crossed in its entirety and society inscribe on its banners from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. So, again, quite a lot of things to unpack there, but basically he says that when what he calls first phase of communist society, so what we would consider socialist society, when that emerges from capitalism after the revolution, it will have what Marx called bourgeois right. And bourgeois right, basically, he, he's talking about the fact that there will still be the use of money or labor vouchers or cer certificates of some kind. The maxim from each according to his ability to each according to his need is not yet in place. You know, in the Soviet Union, they said, we don't have from each according to his ability to each according to his needs yet, because it's not full communism. Instead, we have from each according to his ability to each according to his work, i.e. you work and you get things. Because they don't have superabundance, they can't just give things for free yet, because it's not full communism. The Soviets basically totally agree with Marx. To make this more clear, let's look at one more thing that Marx says on this. This is also from the Critique of the Gotha program. So he says, quote, What we have to deal with here is a communist society, not as it has developed on its own foundations, but on the contrary, just as it emerges from capitalist society, so again, socialism, which is thus, in every respect, economically, morally, and intellectually, still stamped with the birthmarks of the old society and from whose womb it emerges. Accordingly, and this is a key part, Accordingly, the individual producer receives back from society, after the deductions have been made, exactly what he gives to it. What he has given to it is his individual quantum of labor. For example, the social working day consists of the sum of the individual hours of work. The individual labor time of the individual producer is the part of the social working day contributed by him. He shares in it. He receives a certificate from society that he has furnished such and such an amount of labor after deducting his labor for the common funds, and with this certificate he draws from the social stock of means of consumption as much as the same amount of labor costs. The same amount of labor which he has given to society in one form he receives back in another. Again, he's talking about socialism as it's just emerged after a revolution, and he says that you won't get things for free, there will still be money, you work, you get a voucher or a certificate or m money, basically money, something that acts as a currency and which entitles you to get goods, commodities. You work, you get a piece of paper or a bill of some kind, and then you go to the store, you give him that money basically, and then they give you commodities. That is what Marx says happens in a lower phase of communism. The same amount of labor which he has given to society, he receives back in another. So you work, you get paid, you use that to get products. Now, was Marx a Stalinist when he said this? This seems perfectly reasonable to me. They can't have, they're not in full communism, so of course they're going to have this kind of thing happen. 
this is exactly what happened in the Soviet Union, but I guess it's different when Marx says it and when the Soviets do it, I don't know, according to these left communists. One interesting thing is that Marx does point out, because um, basically sometimes these left communists, they will say that, well, the Soviet bureaucracy, uh, they exploited the workers. They don't have a good argument for saying that they exploited the workers, because exploitation is a thing that Marx clearly defines, and it didn't happen in the USSR. But Marx even takes this into account, because he says that after the necessary deductions, after deducting his labor for the common funds, he draws from the social stock, means of consumption, as much as the same amount of labor cost. So, common funds, what, what is that? That is the funds needed to develop society. That is basically socialist profit, okay? Left communists will say, uh, socialist profit, socialist companies can't make any profit. We're not talking about capitalist profits, we're not talking about surplus value, we're talking about a different thing. Surplus value is when a capitalist exploits a worker and he um, doesn't pay the full price of the labor and instead keeps the surplus value for himself. That is surplus value, that is capitalist exploitation. But in socialism, what happens is the worker performs the work, he gets paid, but because the society has to receive some kind of funds to run, they basically take a cut and no individual capitalist or individual party bureaucrat gets that it is instead used to run society as a whole. And yeah, the administrator's wages are paid with that, of course, but that is hardly the same thing as Marx himself says it. There's a deduction that's going to be made for the running of society, for developing infrastructure and all kinds of things like that. So again, you can't really say that the USSR was, like, bad unless you think that Marx was, like, an evil Stalinist. Let's move on. So he says... Quote, here obviously the same principle prevails as that which regulates the exchange of commodities, as far as this exchange of equal values. Content and form are changed because under altered circumstances no one can give anything except his labor, and because on the other hand nothing can pass to the ownership of individuals except individual means of consumption. But as far as the distribution of the latter among the individual producers is concerned, the same principle prevails as in the exchange of commodity equivalents. A given amount of labor in one form is exchanged for an equal amount of labor in another form. He's talking about socialism. So, in socialism, you um, you can only get money by working, and you can't get means of production, you can only get means of consumption. And then, this is a key point, he says, hence, equal right here is still, in principle, bourgeois right, although principle and practice are no longer at loggerheads. While the exchange of equivalents in commodity exchange exists, only on the average and not in the individual case. And then he just goes on to say that in spite of this advance, this equal right is still constantly stigmatized by a bourgeois limitation. The right of producers is proportional to the labor they supply. Equality consists in the fact that measurement is made with an equal standard labor. So he's saying that, yeah, 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 like this is the lower phase of communism or what we would call socialism. It's still not full communism because it's still quote-unquote, stigmatized by bourgeois limitations, that the right of producers is proportional to the labor they supply. You only get stuff if you work for it. You don't get according to need yet. I mean, of course, the society wants to give you free health care and all kinds of things like that, but they can't give you absolutely everything for free. If you are able to work, then you will work, and then you will be given things depending on how much you work. And, you know, this is exactly where the Soviet Union got its idea of from each according to his ability to each according to his work, as the socialist maxim. And, uh, yeah, the equality here consists of the fact that this transaction is merely fair, that you're not giving things for free yet, but at least you're not exploited. The equality consists in the fact that measurement is made with an equal standard of labor. Nobody is exploiting another person, but you're still not being given things for free. Okay, so, rather complicated thing. Like I said, if they really had a really solid case against the Soviet Union, I don't think they would need to even go for these kinds of arguments that take so much time to even unpack. But it's fairly obvious that the left communists are full of crap on this when they say that eh, the Soviet Union had commodity production. Like uh, The last thing, wage labor. In order for commodity production to be capitalistic, it has to have wage labor. Now, the Soviet Union didn't have wage labor, 
oftentimes left communists will accept this, but sometimes they won't. So the ones that say that, oh, the Soviet Union had wage labor, therefore it wasn't socialist, I've never been given any proof of this, like any actual sources or anything. So I'm guessing that they misunderstand what wage labor means. But basically, um, wage labor does not simply mean that when you are paid a wage. Like it says, it presupposes capital, and capital presupposes it. And what is capital? Capital is value in motion. It is um, money invested in a capitalistic activity to get surplus value via exploitation. And that is what wage labor is. Wage labor is when there is exploitation. It's not just that you're given a wage. When Marx talks about wage labor, he means a very specific thing. He means a feature of capitalism. I hope that clarifies things a little bit. It's complicated. Like, I think that if they really had a good case, they wouldn't even need to resort to weird theoretical arguments like this. Like, when I say that modern China is not really a socialist, it's pretty easy. You can just point to the fact that they have capitalists and markets and all these things. And when I say that um, Macno didn't implement socialism, I can just point to the fact that they didn't have collective ownership of the means of production. Or when you want to show that, like, Hitler didn't have a socialist economy, it's pretty fucking easy. Because he had markets, and he had private industry and private ownership of the means of production. But these left comms, they try to come up with like all kinds of excuses, like why their ideology is supposedly just as valid as Leninism. They try to minimize achievements of socialism in history to basically boost up their own like ridiculous thing. Parks after dark by candlelight.